Well, good evening and welcome to our third annual PAIN conference. And like the others, as you can see, this has just been booked out. PAIN, most of us in the room will have a story about it, chronic or unspecified or difficult to control. Indeed, just look down the row that you're in. Every fifth person, on average, feels pain at any given time. But what's our understanding of it? And where is the research headed? And what else can we do to recognise its importance? A terrific evening ahead, and I'd like to start by welcoming you all on behalf of Professor Brandon Wainwright and the IMB, and acknowledge with us tonight Professor Peter Hoy, the University's Vice-Chancellor and President, our wonderful speakers, and of course you, our guests. My name is Madonna King, I'm your MC, and if there's any way I can make your evening uh, more enjoyable, please let me know. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet and pay our respects to their elders, past and present. A few housekeeping issues. If I could ask you to check that your mobile phone is now on silent. The restrooms are through the entry, down the stairs and immediately at the bottom of the stairs. And in the unlikely event of emergency, we would just follow closely the instructions given to us by staff. Tonight will unfold in this way. We're going to hear from the perspectives of a patient, clinician and researcher before welcoming our panel to the stage and answering your questions. I'd ask, given time limits and the nature of the evening, that personal diagnoses not be sought, but there will be a chance after the panel to catch up personally with each of our guests. If you want to join the conversation on Twitter, our Twitter handle is at IMB at UQ, as you can see on the screen. So let's get underway. And I'd like to invite up Dr Coralie Wales, a founding director of Chronic Pain Australia. Coralie has a PhD in community and behavioural health, for which she examined contextual and systemic influence on health professionals working with people in pain. She convenes National Pain Week on behalf of Chronic Pain Australia and provides education for professionals in the complex neurophysiology of chronic pain. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr Wales. Thanks, Madonna. I'm here because the organisation that I am a volunteer for is the voice for people that live with chronic pain in Australia. Can I start by asking for a show of hands, who in this room lives with chronic pain? Hmm, it's more than one in five. Okay, we're going to start the ball rolling with a short video, 30 seconds. One more. You can't see chronic pain, it's invisible. One in five Australians live with it every day. This pain really affects relationships, ability to work, and feel part of a community. Check in with your friends and family. You look good, but how do you feel? So, National Pain Week, it's just around the corner. It's next week, actually. Now, if you can't get to Westmead Hospital, we are live streaming this event because we would like all of you to be a part of it. So, let me tell you a story. I like a good story. So how did Chronic Pain Australia start and why? It all began when I became aware of the problem. I was a consultant, I was a health professional working with Sir Lorimer Mosley in the front row. We were in an environment where it was very convenient to delegitimise the person who lived with chronic pain, because there was a financial reason for that. Needless to say, Lorimer and I moved on. But that led me into a situation where I, I, I reflect and I think I opened Pandora's box because I wanted to know what was going on for people in chronic pain. So I had a clinic, I was a counsellor, I, had a, I was specialising in helping people with chronic pain. And when I put this notice on the web page, 
about are you somebody who lives with chronic pain? Tell us about it. That opened a can of worms for me because all of a sudden I realised that there was no particular community support for people that lived with chronic pain and who were suicidal. I was taking phone calls. When somebody tells you they're suicidal, you really have to do something about it. So I was taking phone calls. I knew that it was a hidden problem and I knew I couldn't turn away from it. So Chronic Pain Australia was incorporated as an association in 2006, so we're 10 years old this year. Happy birthday. In Australia, there are 4.3 million people who live with chronic pain, and I think that's an underestimate. Other research around the world estimates a much higher number of people that live with chronic pain, but it is largely silent. Now, for over 15 years, I've been an insider to the stories that people in pain have shared with me, and I've learned a lot. In 2008, Chronic Pain Australia created an online platform called Pain Is Not Invisible, and it became the largest repository for unstructured stories of people in pain, and that, along with a 24-7 forum and social media and annual snapshot surveys, have led me to the following. This is what people in pain talk about. Consistently, they feel socially isolated. They feel alone. They feel that they are a burden on their families. Often people are out of work. If you're in pain for long enough, it may well affect your work. People were being told that their pain would never go away, and that was giving rise to a sense of hopelessness. People were feeling like they were being judged as somehow weak. Now, notwithstanding that social judgment that people in pain are somehow weak, and these are the statements that you will hear and people in pain will tell you, that people will look at them in the eye and say, well, I've got chronic low back pain, I'm at work, what's wrong with you? This is a really common statement that you hear when you're listening to somebody who lives with chronic pain. It's like all pain is the same. And of course we know that pain is an experience that is, is something we cannot possibly understand unless we're living with it. So it's not my experience that people with pain are incredibly weak. Having dealt with and, and talked to and shared and shed tears with people that live with chronic pain for a long time, I can tell you that people in chronic pain deal with enormous physical pain, and I would say that their pain tolerance is quite high. Now, this is, this is where it's a problem. That leads me to a conclusion that people in pain are at high risk of suicide. According to the Interpersonal Theory of Suicide, 2010, and I'm going to quote this, I think I've put this here for you, the outcome of serious suicidal behaviour, that is lethal or near lethal suicide attempts, is most likely to occur in the context of thwarted belongingness, perceived burdensomeness and hopelessness regarding both, reduced fear of suicide and elevated physical pain tolerance. People don't commit suicide because they're frightened of pain. If you've already got pain, it's half the reason why you, you might do it. So what can we do about it? The central mission of Chronic Pain Australia, based on all of that, and people that work for Chronic Pain Australia are up close and personal with all of this a lot of the time, our aims are to reduce the social isolation, and we do this by building community. We've built a community where every week we reach about 15,000 people. We're working on an app that helps people connect, that reduces social isolation. It also helps people with good information about pain, setting goals and how to manage it. We also are really concerned about the culture of stigma that surrounds people in pain, so we aim to reduce that culture. And we do this by helping people understand, and this is not just people in chronic pain, this is the general community, what causes chronic pain? How do you explain chronic pain? And we promote good information in plain language. This is research-based information, but it's in language that people can understand. Why should it be the domain of academics only? 
We're also concerned to create healing relationships or promote or foster healing relationships between provider and receiver of pain services. And we do this by convening annual conferences with a mixed audience, just like this, where you have clinicians, researchers and people in pain in the same room. For example, this year at Westmead Hospital, which is arguably one of the biggest hospitals in New South Wales, probably in the Southern Hemisphere, we've got an audience of 350 people, mixed, clinicians, people in pain, people that live in Western Sydney, and we're asking the, the question at the end of that, that session, how do we co-design a pain service which is based on the needs of the people in pain in the room? Now, it might not look like the pain services that we know. It might look quite different. Very interested in that. So that's a pretty important event. That's how we deal with that particular aim. <clears throat> so through this, this work over the last 10 years, we believe we have saved lives. In the forum, which is um, on all the time, at any one time, we hear people talk about the life-saving qualities of being part of a community, of feeling understood, of knowing that there is somebody there that you can have a rant with when you're feeling pretty crook, when you're feeling like life is really difficult, knowing that there is an, an audience for you of other people that understand the language, that understand the experience. So we believe we've, sa we've saved lives. Thousands of people at any one time are tuned into that and they are feeling heard and not judged. National Pain Week addresses these aims. In 2010, there were only a handful of TV um, impressions during that period in July. Last year, there were 84. We know that it's working. We're having an effect. So what would I say to you? In this audience, if you know somebody who lives with chronic pain, we would say to you, check in with them. Ask them. You look good. But how do you feel? People in pain can look fantastic. They work really hard at looking normal. They don't want to look like somebody in pain. People spend hours in the morning just getting out of bed. I can tell you this because I know those people. I've spoken to those people where it's 10 minutes just to do the exercises in the bed before you can put your feet on the ground. So we're asking clinicians and community members to promote the following. Hopefulness, statements like, this pain will always be there, you have to learn to live with it, is not necessarily true. I know people who have managed their pain out of existence. It's not necessarily true. Connection, and I think Lorimer has got all the evidence that you need to demonstrate that it's not necessarily true. We can reverse a lot of the stuff that happens in the brain. Connection, connect people up with, with community, the community building that's central to Chronic Pain Australia's mission. We welcome both clinicians, researchers, anybody who's interested and people in pain to join that community. It's good for everybody to hear those conversations, to be part of the conversation. Knowledge. Congratulations to IMB. You guys are standing out on a limb, doing stuff that is totally innovative. And this is what we need. We need our partners to forge new pathways of hope and knowledge for people that live with chronic pain. Kindness, you know what? It's basic, it's free. Return on investment is massive. Empathy, ask the question, what's it like to be you in pain? Non-judgment, again, the return on investment is huge. If you do all of that, you will be part of the healing process. Thank you for allowing me to speak up for people in pain. Thank you, Coralie. Um, now to Professor Mosley, uh, NHMRC Principal Research Fellow, Professor of Clinical Neurosciences at the University of South Australia, and Senior Principal Research Fellow at Neuroscience Research Australia. And he leads, as most of you know, the Body and Mind Research Group, which investigates the role of the brain and the mind in chronic pain. He's widely published. In fact, uh, he's the author of two of the highest-selling pain-related books internationally. I think Coralie put it uh, correctly, or put it best. Could you please join me in welcoming Sir Lorimer Mosley? <laughs> Thank you. 
Thanks, Madonna. Uh, thanks, Carly. Easiest knighthood you'll ever witness. Uh, that's terrific. Uh, it's a real privilege for me to be back, back here. I was here a few months ago and to be part of this evening. Congratulations uh, on the work that IMB is doing in this space. Um, it's, a, it's a top research outfit and it's particularly admirable, I think, for, uh, for someone like me who comes from the other end of the human because I'm really interested in consciousness and uh, how the brain works and why the brain makes pain when it's not very constructive for the brain to do that. Uh, and it's very mysterious. I don't understand what I'm doing very well, uh, but that means I should have a job for a while, which is sort of good. Uh, I would also like to pay my respects to the Turbul and Jagara people uh, who have been telling stories on this land for a very long time, and it's, uh, it's a real privilege to me to be on, on this land, uh, their land, to be telling my story, so I'm, I'm grateful for that opportunity. Uh, so, I have some disclosures, and normally when you speak anywhere, people do this, they say, so there are my disclosures. <laughs> but actually, it's really important to, to understand why we make decisions about things, and, and I do think that it's important for you to know that I have conflicts of interest, because as a scientist, those conflicts of interest affect my decisions, and as a communicator, they affect how I want to communicate things. Most of these are probably not immediately relevant to an evening like this. Some of them are. Uh, if you go and buy a book I wrote, if all of you buy a book that I wrote, or several of those books, for example, you might know a friend who speaks Portuguese. You should get the translation. If you all got four or five copies, I would be able to go out to dinner <laughs> on that money, which would be great. Uh, there's a few key messages that I would love to get across to you, and and they really excite me as a, as a clinical scientist. The first is that, that we are the greatest predictors the world has ever known. We're always predicting what's around the corner and we prepare biologically for what is around the corner. Here's an example. So I know if, if any of you have been to a talk that I've done, you have probably seen these slides. These are my favourite slides for talking about pain. Uh, but they're not about pain at all. And I speak to people in pain about these, uh, these issues because it's a really nice way in to understanding pain. But uh, can you raise your hand if you've heard me talk about this picture before? Excellent. Don't give it away. <laughs> so, for the rest of you, uh, can you raise your hand if when you look at this picture, the diamond with A in it looks darker than the diamond with B in it? Excellent. None of you are suffering from a very rare neurological and socially embarrassing disorder. Uh, but, actually, that's not, uh, that's not true. They're not the same shade of grey. If we take them out to the side, you'll see... Uh, sorry, they, they are identical shades of grey. They're not different. You are making a very quick decision about that. But have a look at what happens. Now, I want you all to do this the same way so you don't hit heads. Can you all just turn your head that way? And if you can get your eyes vertical, completely vertical, have a look at it that way. One eye has to be on top of the other. Nothing changes. <laughs> and you, you, can see the <laughs> you can see the people who have done this before because they all do this. <laughs> oh, you're not getting me again for that. So what really happens, this is the information that hits your retina and that information goes to the back of the brain and I remember doing Perception 101 at school where the teacher, who was ironically named Mrs Smart, said uh, it hits the retina upside down. And I remember us all being quite amazed. Wow, you mean our brain is able to flip the image back the other way? Which is not that remarkable, right? It's not that, that easy. The message goes to the retina and sure enough there are a lot of cells back at the back of the brain that give you this visual experience. But I remember asking Mr Smart, you would think that we would have evolved to instead of having all of those billions of brain cells in the occipital cortex, in the primary visual cortex, uh, we could just put another retina there because that would flip the image again, and we could use all of those brain cells to think with. 
Just imagine how clever we would be. And Mrs. Smart looked at me and, and said, young man, we are fearfully and wonderfully complex. And that was it. That was her explanation. I immediately dropped my crush on her daughter. <laughs> it's so much groovier than that. And what really happens in the brain is that we are picking up on countless cues, literally countless cues, that tell us how to predict what's the best behaviour to have here. What's the best way to engage with this world? And, and the mechanism by which that occurs is the brain creates an experience for you that makes you engage that way. So in vision, it creates this experience for you because that is a sensible uh, prediction of, of what will be a behavioural outcome. We are the greatest protectors the world has ever known. And by that, I mean self-protectors. We are the most proficient self-protectors on the back of this predictive capacity. And there's a lot of examples for this, but there's some really interesting work you looking at withdrawal reflexes. So when you touch something very hot and you pull away from it. Well, most of the experiments involve uh, giving a painful stimulus to your leg and pulling your leg off the painful stimulus. And you record muscle activity. So it works like this. Danger detectors in the skin, and there's very few, few groups on Earth who punch above the weight of the IMB in investigating danger detectors <coughs> in us. They're very important. For those of you who are in the neighbourhood, call these nociceptors. That triggers an automatic withdrawal reflex through the spinal cord and removes the finger. These guys did a really interesting experiment that I think is sort of fun, and you can try this yourself if you've got some of the equipment uh, at home. They looked at the size of the protective reflex by recording muscle activity. They then gave people a variety of odours to smell. And the most interesting part of this research, very well controlled studies, was that if they gave a really disgusting odour to someone, and then they looked at the withdrawal reflex. The disgusting odour increases the size of your withdrawal reflex. Uh, now, I was at the airport, obviously, on the way here. I live in Adelaide. And I went into the Qantas Club toilets, and there was a sign-up that says, uh, to avoid congestion, please use all of the facilities. <laughs> So I was a little bit sniffly, so I used all of the facilities. <laughs> and it's done, it's done the trick. But, but what I did notice, I had a really bizarre experience that I went into one of the cubicles on my tour of the facilities, <laughs> and I was running out. Like if you're toileting everywhere, you run out quite quickly. And the person before me had clearly had a very successful time, and it was a disgusting smelling cubicle. And as I turned around, I hit my leg on the, on the door and I had a particularly big withdrawal response. <laughs> we pain, of all of our protective devices, pain is the most sophisticated protective device. And I like to think of it as the big kahuna, the grand poo bar protective device, because it is the only thing that motivates us to do something. All of the other protective devices we have, immune upregulation, withdrawal reflexes, changing heart rate, uh, endocrine changes, we don't necessarily know about any of those things. As a clinician, I've never had a patient turn up and say, when I ask, why are you here? And have them say, well, uh, my interleukin-4 is elevated. No one ever says this. They say, I'm in pain. That's why they have made the appointment. That's why they are seeking help. That's why they are behaving differently. Pain is this great motivator of behaviour. So we have a very uh, vast range of danger detectors in all of our tissues. They're almost everywhere, with the really intriguing exception of the brain uh, and some of our musculoskeletal tissues. But these danger detectors are almost everywhere. And, and there's a lot of redundancy in that system. So our ability to detect dangerous events is really, really impressive. It's so really uh, almost like the sensors, the first sensors out there, because we can't see everything that happens, and we certainly can't see inside us. 
they send a danger message that has its first relay station in the spinal cord and there is a massive computational capacity in the spinal cord. So some people who are working at that level would, would really regard the spinal cord as, as like a mini brain. The capacity of it to process a lot of information is really quite profound. And it has a very, very significant interaction with your immune system in the spinal cord. So we have an immediate mechanism by which when you are under threat because you are sick, for example, it has the capacity to influence your danger transmission system. And your danger transmission system is the thing that alerts the brain. There's been a significant event in the tissues. And that's all it can say. It can't say you're in pain because there is no pain that actually exists out there. That's up to your brain to produce that pain. And this is the remarkable thing, that pain always depends on how much danger your brain thinks you are in, which sometimes bears little relevance to how much danger, danger you are really in, even within one human. I'd like to tell you a story in the spirit of uh, the evening so far. When I was a physiotherapy student, my professor of neurology said, the worst injuries are often the least painful. And I said, bollocks. And he said, why don't you go and find out? So I went to Royal North Shore Hospital. And I remember hearing this guy who said, no way, Giorgio. And I turned around and a man was walking in with a hammer stuck in his neck. The curly bit was going in the back of his neck and the two sharp bits came out the front. There was blood everywhere. And I'd already had some training. I was third year. <laughs> and I said, there's a hammer stuck in your neck. And he said, yeah, I know. Watch this. This is a real disgusting. He's got, he's got no pain. So I thought, clearly he's had some morphine or something like that. What have you had, mate? He said, oh, well, it was a long way from the building site. I stopped for an egg and bacon roll. <laughs> How cool is that? Imagine working at the cafe. This guy comes up. Oh, just an egg and bacon roll, please, darling. <laughs> so he's not had any drugs. And then I think to myself, he's just stupid. <laughs> His brain doesn't work properly. But then he did this, this thing. He said, Giorgio, let's do it. He said, what am I? <laughs> and I said, you're a nutter. <laughs> And he said, no, no, I'll, I'll do it again. Giorgio, do the sound effects. And Giorgio did this. And he got up and he said, I'm a hammerhead shark. <laughs> so he's, he's clever enough to have choreographed a, a, a show. And then I thought to myself, this is stress-induced analgesia. This is descending noxious inhibitory control. There are no messages getting through until he turned around and hit his knee on a little table. He's got a hammer in his neck. And he went, oh, yeah, whoa. So this is inside one human, severe tissue damage, danger, no pain. Minor tissue damage, same human, same time, same context, severe pain. And I think that triggered, for me, researching pain. Because it is just nowhere near what I, what I thought it was. Anything that, that suggests you need protecting takes your pain up. We now know this. Anything that, that suggests you don't need protecting takes your pain down. Anything. Your MRI result says you've got degenerative changes. And when you read it in your head, you say, oh, there are degenerative changes at L5S1. Compressing on your fecal sac. I had a patient tell me once that they had compression on their faecal sac. <laughs> well, that's okay because she told me she doesn't need a laminectomy. <laughs> we know that professional violinists have a lower pain threshold on their left hand than on their right hand, even though the messages coming from that hand are coming less frequently than they are from this hand. Pain threshold is lower. Why? Because this is, this is a serious loss on your left finger, left hands. On the violin, this one, not so much. You can still play the bow with four fingers, for example. We know 
that Scandinavians have a, have a higher pain threshold for ultraviolet light than people who live near the Mediterranean. And it's not about skin colour. The accepted explanation for this is that it's more dangerous for people who live on the Mediterranean, as a rule. So, we'll be more protected from it than the Scandinavians. This is an experiment we did some time ago. We got supposedly normal, healthy volunteers. Now these people are not normal because they're volunteering for a pain experiment. <laughs> supposedly normal people, we put a very cold stimulus on the back of their hand, but we played a trick on them by showing them a light at the same time as we gave them the cold stimulus. We didn't say anything about the light, but the light was either red which means a lot of stuff to us. There's a lot of cues in, involved with that. And we are the greatest predictors and the greatest protectors the world has ever known. And when it's red, or when it's blue, provokes sometimes a very different experience. So this is the pain experienced by these people when they see a different coloured light, even though the stimulus they receive is identical. Absolutely identical. You might be able to see this person here and this person here, no effect of the light. These people, yeah, they're not colour blind, actually, they were excluded if they were colour blind. So these supposedly normal, non colour blind people, those people we call idiots. <laughs> because they're not picking up on the cues. <laughs> but pain is, is a survival thing, pain is, is a fantastic protection. The problem is when it persists. That's the problem. We've heard a bit about the burden. There's a very influential paper in The Lancet uh, a couple of years ago that ranked chronic pain disorders as the top four most burdensome health conditions facing the planet. Ranking number one, three, four and eight. Um, I'm not sure about the lower ones, but definitely one and three. Back pain and neck pain. More burdensome than anything else. Cost-wise, they cost about the same as cancer and diabetes combined. This is a massive problem and we're not dealing with it very well and it's persistent pain that's the problem. Sometimes people with persistent pain have tissue inflammation. Sometimes there are faulty danger detectors. It's very relevant to the work that's being done here. At the moment, we treat these things with movement and medications uh, with varying levels of, of success. The other ones are undetected danger cues and these are all the things that we might <coughs> Uh, are, are fair targets for identifying danger cues that will modulate pain. Of course, none of those things apply if you are not a human. If you are a human, they apply. So a lot of people who are tempted to say, oh, well, my pain's a physical pain, I can feel it every time I walk. So it's probably not affected by any of these things. And my conclusion is, well, you may very well be right, in which case you are not human. Because this is a human thing, this is, this is not about you. And Coralie mentioned about normalising this stuff and I think that's an important part of, of that. We know that the danger transmission system can become sensitised. We know that the brain networks that actually produce pain become sensitised so they become uh, overactive and, and over able to protect us. So we become hyper protected. What do we do about this? Well, this is the road less travelled, is, is how we think about it. This requires a journey at the moment, not a quick fix. We don't know of a quick fix for this. We tend to think, oh, well, let pain be your guide, or no pain, no gain. And, and I would argue, actually, no pain, K-N-O-W, pain. And you will, K-N-O-W, gain. No, understand pain. That's our first step in what we're trying to do, get people to really understand their pain. We used to ask this question, how strong is my body? And now we ask, well, where is my protector meter at? Why am I protecting so uh, effectively and consistently? Find yourself a good coach, and these can be hard to find, but we're finding them now slowly. You need patience, persistence and courage. Stock up on that because it is a journey for you to take. And then gradually train your brain and your body together. And the good news? It works. There's level one evidence for anyone who's in the hood, meta-analysis level data, that your pain and disability reduce slowly over time. Very, very strong evidence for that, but it's 
Rachel. It won't happen overnight. But it will happen. Thank you very much for uh, having me as part of this evening. Terrific presentation. Thank you, Professor. We're all itching to ask you questions, including how you went in Mrs Smart's report card. Yeah, not so good that Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, we, we get the chance to ask Professor Mosley questions shortly, but now I would like to introduce you to our next speaker before our panel discussion. As a community pharmacist, Dr Jennifer Deuce knows the impact that chronic pain has on patients, how ineffective drugs can be, and the side effects. So she did a, a PhD at UQ School of Pharmacy aimed at understanding pain and developing new treatments. She now works at the Centre for Pain um, Research here at IMB and we look forward to hearing her talk tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr Jennifer Deuce. All right, so um, because my background is uh, as a pharmacist, um, I'm interested in treating pain with drugs. And um, because of that, I know uh, firsthand that there's a lot of room for improvement with current painkillers that we have, and there's an urgent need uh, to develop new ones. So uh, current drug treatments, um, such as paracetamol and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which include aspirin and ibuprofen, can be effective for mild to moderate pain, but often lack efficacy in more severe pain, which is when we usually will turn to the opioid analgesics, uh, such as codeine, morphine, or oxycodone. While they can be effective in severe pain, they don't always work well for everybody, and their use can be limited uh, in chronic pain uh, due to debilitating side effects. Uh, there's a lot of stigma and a fear of addiction, and also uh, they do sometimes require increasing doses over time to retain the same efficacy. Uh, some of our other painkillers, uh, including some antidepressants and anti-epileptics, are reserved for pain that has a neuropathic or nerve component. Um, but just using uh, gabapentin as one example, uh, large clinical trials have shown that um, gabapentin only has efficacy or only works in up to one third of patients. So there's a lot of room for improvement uh, for current painkillers. So the reason that um, all painkillers don't work for everybody is that pain is complex. And we're only beginning to understand that different types of pain uh, have different um, causes and, and the, the um, underlying molecular mechanisms are not the same. And because of this, here at the IMB Centre for Pain Research, we've got research areas focused on different types of pain to address this. So some of our current areas of pain research are focused on burns pain, uh, chemotherapy induced pain, and neuropathic pain. We also know uh, that pain can be targeted at many areas of the pain pathway, and we're most interested at the, uh, the danger detectors, or we call them the uh, nociceptors or our pain sensing nerves. Uh, but from there, the pain signals are uh, transmitted to the spinal cord, which then carries the message up to the brain. And it's where the brain is where the pain signal is processed. So we know that we can target pain uh, at different places along this pathway. But we're most interested, as I said before, in the, uh, the pain sensing nerves or the danger detectors. And these uh, pain sensing nerves have many ion channels and receptors that we can target to block pain. And one of our aims here is to try and identify new targets to treat pain and then to develop new treatments um, that block these targets as new classes of pain as painkillers. Um, and one um, target that we're particularly interested in is called NAV 1.7, uh, which is a sodium channel that is located on these pain-sensing nerves. 
And the reason that we're so interested in this uh, sodium channel is because in humans who do not have this channel anymore, uh, due to a rare genetic mutation, they no longer experience pain at all. So they have no sensation of pain. Uh, they are otherwise normal, um, except for some deficits in their sense of smell. So they uh, have normal sensations of temperature and touch. Uh, so this makes this channel, NAV 1.7, a really exciting pain target because it might mean that we can selectively switch off pain at the source. And so if we block this NAV 1.7 channel, which is almost, uh, was located almost exclusively on our pain-sensing nerves, if we can block pain at the source, then these pain signals won't be sent up um, to the spinal cord and then to the brain. Now, it's not easy to selectively target this sodium channel, NAV 1.7, because we actually have nine sodium channels expressed on different nerves throughout the body. And in order to have a painkiller that is safe, um, it needs to be selective for NAV 1.7. And this is because uh, we've got uh, sodium channels NAV 1.1, 1 1.2 and 1.3 located in our central nervous system or in the brain. And if you were to develop a painkiller that targeted these sodium channels, uh, you would have uh, quite bad side effects that, that would probably include you know, coma or sedation. So that's completely unacceptable. Uh, if we target NAV 1.4, which is expressed in skeletal muscle, um, you would likely have paralysis or tremors. If we were to block NAV 1.5, which is expressed in our heart, so it's really important for the conduction in the heart, um, you would probably have problems with um, arrhythmias or abnormal heart rates or even heart attacks. And then another one we want to avoid is NAB 1.6, uh, which is expressed on motor neurons, which help us move. And again, that would result in paralysis uh, or breathing problems. So it's been quite challenging to develop uh, painkillers that are selective for this NAB 1.7, and progress in this area has been slow. Uh, since this uh, iron channel was identified as a target uh, about 10 years ago. So we've taken the approach of looking at spider venom as a novel source for painkillers. And this is because uh, individual venom components of, um, from spiders can control the nervous system of insects and incidentally um, can control the nervous system of humans. And compared to man-made compounds, uh, individual venom components from spiders often have unprecedented selectivity for sodium channels, including NAV 1.7. And one such venom component, um, called PN1A, uh, was discovered here at the IMB and is currently being developed by the IMB Centre for Pain Research as a new class of painkiller. It's one of the most selective blockers of NAV 1.7 reported to date. And unlike opioid analgesics, it's unlikely to have addiction problems, um, cause debilitating side effects, uh, or have a decrease in efficacy over time. And just to give you an idea of how selective it is, you would need 100 times the amount before PN1A would start to target your other sodium channels, the ones that we want to avoid um, for side effects. Uh, so you're probably all wondering how far away PN1A um, is from the market. Well, we've got a little while to go, uh, as that's just how you know, drug research is. Uh, so there's four main stages of drug development. Uh, the first stage is discovery and characterization. Uh, which has taken us four years. The next stage is preclinical research, uh, then clinical development, and this is where human trials would take place. Uh, so that would take an additional six to eight years. And then finally, the fourth stage would be market approval. So we have completed the first stage with PN1A, and we're now looking uh, for pharmaceutical companies or venture capitalist partners uh, to help take PN1A uh, to the next stage of development. And 
Even though uh, tonight's theme was making pain personal, because PN1A targets this NAB 1.7, uh, which is on these pain-sensing neurons, it's exciting to think that maybe it won't be personal and it might be able to treat a wide variety of different types of pain. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. Just terrific. Um, so, yeah, if you could stay here and if I could invite um, our panellists to the stage, Professor Mosley and Dr Coralie Wales, along with Professor Richard Lewis and Dr Irina Vetter. Now, Professor Lewis is Director of IMB's Centre of Pain Research and his research focuses on the discovery, evolution and structure function of venom peptides, especially those with potential for the treatment of difficult to manage pain. And Dr Irina Vetter is Deputy Director of IMB's Centre for Pain Research. Her research is aimed at understanding the molecular mechanisms behind pain and the current focus is using toxins from plants and venomous animals to understand the molecular pharmacology of pain. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our stellar panel. So I'm going to start by asking a couple of questions to our new panellists and then I would like to get to as many as we can. So once we start, if you've got a question, short question, short answer, and we'll try and get through as many as we can. Thank you. Richard, let me uh, start with you uh, and Irina before we go to those questions. How seriously do you think we take pain research in Australia? Unfortunately, Madonna, not, not seriously enough, as, as we've heard, I think. I mean, if... All too often pain is seen as a symptom and it's not seen as a treatable illness. We're all told we should treat the cause of the disease and, and obviously pain will look after itself. But so often we can't treat the disease, people live with pain, and even when the disease is gone, people are still left with chronic pain. So that's not the answer. So we've heard your team, what your team's doing in stopping feeling pain and you've got your own research underway there. Is it realistic that we would come to a stage where we would stop feeling pain? Well, I certainly think um, that there's a good chance that, um, that we can get to that point. Um, so, as you've heard from Jennifer today, we have, have some really exciting molecules um, that we're currently developing. Um, I'm sure Lorimer would like to argue that um, maybe it's all in the brain, but I'm still hopeful that I I'm going to be the one who's right and you might be out of Look, I can see you're edging for a fight, so <laughs> let me ask you this question. Whether you, basically, whether you agree or not with, with Laura, mate, where do you think, Irene, a pain is felt? Uh, I think it's, um, that's a trick question. And I can't answer that one. Um, what, um, what I do think is that um, pain is incredibly complex. Our understanding is quite poor of um, how it arises and how we can treat it. But it's a challenge and an opportunity at the same time. So I think we can probably treat pain in multiple different ways. And realistically, both Lorimer and I will hopefully have a job for, for a while to come. Uh, a, a cheeky question before we go on. We're talking about different individuals. And Lorimer, you were talking about that and training and getting a coach. So I'll throw this one to you. Uh, we hear about the man flu. Do, do, do women or men feel pain more, or how much do people's pain thresholds vary? Uh, yes, women or men do feel pain more. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, I'm feeling like Mrs Smart right now. <laughs> pain thresholds are, are quite variable between people, but more intriguingly, they're, they're quite variable within people. Uh, so we do a lot of experiments where we do deliver fixed stimuli so we know what's happening at the at, at the terminal end at, at what I would call danger sensing neurons yes uh, and we really can't produce the same experience twice so uh, I, I'm not being cheeky here but if we've known for 40 years that pain can be changed by what we actually think about why isn't that what our GPS are telling us when we go and see them well, I guess you'd, you'd want to direct that question to the GPs, but uh, my... I, I, might, share, I might send it to Irina in just a moment. I mean, I, I share that frustration, but I also have sympathy that uh, GPs have got five minutes and they've got someone who's in trouble and they can't be cutting edge. I mean, I, I think a more relevant question would be why are we still struggling with a, an issue that's uh, getting 
struggling getting attention with an issue that we've known for two decades yeah. is our mo most massive health problem. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to, to pause it there and go to your questions. Please raise your hand and we'll get a microphone. If we could have the microphone runners up and down. Who'd like to go first? Thank you, ma'am. Up the back there. And then on this side, who's next? Just keep your hands up and we'll go to you. I was going to ask uh, how, I ask it every time I go to a pain conference, how many uh, med students are actually being taught anything about chronic pain and each time it's sort of a little bit more like an hour and a half instead of an hour. And that yet at the beginning of this we actually had amongst the panel, we actually don't have agreement about what pain is and I, we hear some nerve pathway talk and then we hear that there's a dispute about actually whether the, the pa chronic pain is in the brain or it's actually something different. So then it becomes really hard for us as practitioners to actually try and explain this when, you know, sometimes there's a confusing message. So what does everyone think about that? Actually, I think that there's no, there's no conflict. I think um, I, I tried to allude to that, that it's, um, it's so complex that there are multiple opportunities. So um, both Lorimer and I are right. Um, but it, it is very complex, and, and um, you're touching on an important point that um, it just doesn't pain doesn't get the attention it deserves at the moment in the in the healthcare system, in the medical system, and you certainly can't uh, teach a medical student in an hour or an hour and a half. I think um, all the things that they they would need to know to manage it effectively in the community. Can I, I'll respond to it too, because I think that some of what you're observing is is a language issue. Uh, and I mean, I, I really felt too the distinction between the language that I used and the language that you use, Jen, on uh, saying pain sensing neurons. And for me, with a with a patient in front of me, me suggesting that it's a pain sensing neuron under, undermines everything that I think is evidence based that should happen in that person's life. So I feel like that's not semantic. I feel that it's a very important issue to use the right to use the, the terms that are defendable by science, in my view. So I think we should be talking about nociceptors, not pain-sensing neurons. And I don't think they're pain pathways. I think they're nociceptive pathways. And they're high-threshold neurons, and they're really important. But I think that you need a human to feel pain. Uh, and in the education for our medical students and every other student, I would really like to see a, an appreciation of that with the, with the patient interaction in mind. Uh, so I. I, I actually agree with Irene insofar as I think that we would both have very similar ideas of what pain is, but I think there's a, there's a diversity in this panel uh, about strength of feeling to do with semantics, and my strength of feeling is very high. Is that, is that okay? So your view is that if we strengthen our mind, we will mute the pain? You've got to be so careful. You've got to be so careful when you start talking about the mind. Yeah. Because we're not talking about the mind, we're talking about the brain. And the mind is different to the brain. So I think what we're talking about is really a language that says if all pain is processed in the brain, as all experience is, then we have to start talking about how do we communicate that to many people who cross the threshold of a GP's um, practice. And that must be so frustrating for someone sitting in your, your chair, you know, from, from the patient's perspective. Mm. Well, when you hear the stories and you know that people feel misunderstood, they feel that, you know, when you start talking about the mind, the, the next comment is, you think this is in my mind. Yeah. And that's why we have to be so careful. Because yeah. it's not in the mind, it's in the brain, which is different. Right. A question from Meg. Is nerve pain real or imagined? And that's to Lorimer and Irina. I would say real. Absolutely real. Okay, that one was easily dismissed. What about this question? And please raise your hand, and I'd love to go to ones from the floor. What is the worst pain imaginable? I mean, is it quantifiable? So I guess nerve pain versus a caesarean versus whatever. The worst pain is the pain that is experienced by somebody who has lost everything. Because it's that context for pain when somebody is in a very bad place 
and they've lost their job, they've lost their family, their husband's walked out the door or their wife's walked out the door, their kids. I've heard stories about kids who actually tread over the father who's crippled on the floor. They're so used to seeing him so disabled that they don't see him anymore. Now, that's pretty bad. So it will be contextual. Do you agree with that, Irina? I have a slightly different view by the look on your face. Um, not really. I think it's um, from, from a person who researches... Uh, nociceptors, it's, it's pretty meaningless. You can measure how many nociceptors are activated or not, but I, but I completely agree that, um, that it is, it's meaningless to define in terms of how severe pain is. Yeah, how quantifiable. Yeah. Right, our next question. Thank you. Uh, Lorimer, I'm a physio. I've been, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Um, I work in a practice with a lot of young physios and I suppose... I put this question, I told them that I was coming to this lecture and what would they um, want for me to ask you. So this question really is a combination of all of their thoughts. So I'm going to read it to you because it's quite complicated, but I'm sure the answer might be quite simple for you. So what they, what they asked is, keeping in mind that normal movement differs between individuals and adults, and in particular children, why is <coughs> establishing... Uh, and experience and norm, experiencing normal pain-free movement affect the perception of pain overall. And following that, is there a protocol to predict the, um, with movement, body type, personality, age, or any other parameter that you can think of that can help us identify patients that will do poorly with hands-on therapy? And that, is there a study that suggests um, that the language of either the therapist or the doctor at that initial point of contact has a long-term effect mm. on the patient's outcome. Wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. 30 seconds. Yeah, so the answer number three is yes. The answer number two is I don't think so, but a lot of people are trying to work out what predicts response to manual therapy. Uh, and the answer number one is... Uh, is, is probably pretty lame. They're probably not going to be very satisfied with the answer. But my answer to that would be uh, I fall back on if, if anything about that experience of pain-free movement is sending a safety cue, and there are so many potential pathways that safety cues will be delivered from a change in balance at the dorsal horn to a change in, a change in mechanics, change in balance at the dorsal horn, change in balance at the thalamus, high-order cognitive stuff that sends safety cues, then I think, yeah, absolutely, all of those pathways could have ongoing and super additive uh, synergistic effects on the production of pain. But I always fall back to if it's a safety cue, it will reduce protection. Yes, ma'am, down here. Thank you. I just wait to the microphone. Yeah. And who on this side? Can you raise your hand and we'll get a microphone to you too? Okay. Uh, Julia Fleming, Brisbane uh, clinician. A uh, question for Lorimer, please. Um, just in this uh, dialogue and perceived dichotomy in relation to spinal nociception slash withdrawal reflex um, and then uh, the, the brain, and I'd say brain slash mind because I don't think if it's not in your mind, it's not pain, pleasures in the mind, it's not in the brain. It's, but you've got to have a brain to have it. Uh, but in that dichotomy, could you tell us about your research into interpersonal space and danger cues you receive? Because often I see clinically that as soon as you get to someone's sore spot, you can be two feet away and you'll see the flinch. And there are certain techniques and medications you can use that will not only just make them feel better, but that space contracts. So, I mean, I know you... Yeah, sure. but, but I think it's a way the brain slash mind and spinal stuff all comes together. OK, Professor. Wow. Wow. Uh, you're so informed, Julia. Um, so, yeah, I'm really interested in that as, as well, this idea of do we, do we protect, protect just a body part or do we protect an area of space? And I think there's compelling evidence that we protect an area of space. And overprotection of an area of space comes at a cost with all of our regulatory systems blood flow and immune regulation, I mean, in a, in a really potentially devastating way. Uh, slides that I removed because there was a bit of general panic that I had too many slides included a series of studies that, that we've done 
where we look at the blink reflex as a marker of protection, uh, which is meant to be a brainstem mediated very easy response. And uh, if you stimulate it with the hand out there, you get a blink. But if you stimulate it with the hand there, you get a bigger blink. If you stick a piece of wood between here, you don't get a blink. Uh, and if you stick a piece of tissue paper, your blink comes back. So it's a, it's a highly cognitively controlled automatic reflex. And I think that we could take that into the clinic in exactly the way that you're describing, that if, if an unpredictable stimulus comes into a space, then you would protect from that. Uh, you know, my experience at CRPS, where they, they'll go right around the room yep. clockwise to keep yes. you from going into their space. Yeah. He's pretty good, isn't he? Up the back, thank you. Um, in the hospital I work at, um, the burns unit are looking at the use of um, hypnosis in acute pain with some success. I'm just wondering, is there any usefulness in persistent pain in hypnosis? Who'd like to take that? Lorimer? Yeah, but I really don't want to hog. Um, well, you're doing I'm, pretty good. I'm happy to speak to that because we're involved in the hypnosis space of persistent pain. There's pretty good evidence that hypnosis as a standalone treatment is not very helpful, can get short term benefits. Uh, we're asking for money and have got good pilot data to use uh, hypnotic strategies, which are really just cognitive strategies, hypnotic <coughs> suggestion, along with the idea of explaining pain biology, because we, we're reasonably confident that will have a super additive effect on the effects of something else. Hypnosis uh, improves the effects of mindfulness and, and ACT. But I think it's a standalone for persistent pain. I think we've also been missing the point a little bit with hypnosis and, and that saying, uh, ha applying it with an old fashioned idea of what pain is, which is the really Descartian sort of idea of it. Um, so I think, I think it's got potential, but not as a standalone. Along the same lines, this question comes from Rija. How effective is massage in chronic pain in the elderly population and how does massage compare with exercises as effective pain management treatment? You know anything about that, Caroline? Well, I mean, the, the thought that comes to mind is that touch is really important because it's about connection. So I don't know, you know, massage, what sort of massage and what sort of exercise... If it's exercise that's associated with fun and joy and laughter, perhaps it's a really good thing. If it's massage that's associated with care... OK, uh, we'll go to those questions in just a moment, but in the same way, this one to uh, Irina from Michelle. Um, can I, uh, what's the role of diet and exercise in alleviating pain? <laughs> it's one of those um, questions, how, how long do we have? And, um, I, I think probably... Uh, what we do a little bit poorly is to uh, view people who suffer from pain as a person. So obviously diet and exercise um, play a huge role in that. And um, I'm not sure that having a good diet will necessarily um, you know, provide pain relief, but by the same token, I'm sure that if you don't get good sleep or don't have a good diet, I'm sure that you can't really um, get pain relief either. So I think we really need to look at it from a holistic perspective. What about the um, nature of anti-inflammatory inputs? Um, from, from diet? From food, yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't, I'm not familiar with the evidence of whether there's any particular food group, but... Um... Okay, well, let's go to our next question. We've got a couple up here. Thank you. Um, so I actually... I want to answer a question real quick that was raised earlier about education because I'm at the medical school here and just today we actually uh, we entertained a, a speaker from Arthritis Australia who gave us a patient perspective on chronic pain uh, that was very well received and my understanding is we have a full week on pain second year. Uh, so it's not perfect and you know I'm working hard on kind of getting some more information out there but as an American visiting Australia I see that there is a lot of effort being put into this issue here and I think that you're honestly a little bit ahead of us in terms of spreading the word about chronic pain and getting medical students educated about it. Uh, but I will ask a question, and uh, on a completely unrelated note, uh, as a patient, I just really hate being asked how much pain I'm in on a scale of 1 to 10. So with that in mind, what do you think is the best way to evaluate a patient's pain? And as you asked that, several people were nodding around the room. Can I say something? From, from personal experience, um, I would say that the most meaningful question would be, do you need pain relief? Because, um, I don't know, either it's a yes or no question. So 
you know, when I was in a situation where I was asked, what's your pain on a scale of 1 to 10? It's just shrugging. You can't answer that necessarily in that situation. So for me, it would have been, you know, do you need pain relief, yes or no? Richard, what would you think there? Oh, I agree with Irina. I think it's a difficult scale. It's very relative. Yeah. So it depends on your, your history and your background. All right, let's go to our next question. Thank you. Oh, thanks very much. Um, my first comment is I'd just really like to commend um, the Chronic Pain Australia and IMB for putting on this forum because I do think that learning together, um, patients and clinicians and researchers, is really the only way we're going to get the story about chronic pain sort of changed. Yeah. So it's not up to kind of, if you're just relying on teaching medical students, they're going to be untaught in hospitals. Um, so it's learning together with our patients that's really important. I just, I'm a GP, so that's just saying from that point of view. Um, my question, though, is really around... Um, I'm aware there's been a, there's a growing issue in Australia with the misuse of opioids in, in chronic pain. Um, and, again, you painted that picture really well where a, a patient's your GP might have five minutes, oh, here's a pain medication, and it's seen as strong, you've got bad pain, and the dose just goes up and up, and yet it, it doesn't give us the outcomes that we that we need um, and we're seeing more and more issues with that and then again the pa patient is blamed um, although it's not really their fault we have to have a more sophisticated approach to it um, so I'd just like your comments about that because I know in America it's become a really big issue. Okay. And, oh sorry just also around that is I'm also concerned about where that's going to go with medical marijuana too because I see that's going to have the same issue. Okay who would like to take that first? Not me. <laughs> <laughs> Jen? Um, yeah, so as a pharmacist, you know, we, we get the, the opioid scripts. Um, I think the codeine has been a big, uh, has been in the news a lot lately um, with about, you know, whether it should be available over the counter or whether it should become um, prescription only. And um, we, I think from a pharmacist's perspective, uh, a lot of people are self-managing their pain before even seeing the GP. And I don't think um, that a lot of them are addicted like they're being um, made out to be or portrayed to be. I think they're just um, trying to manage their pain as best they can and it's just not getting managed. And that's why they may be abusing these drugs, but not for a euphoric effect. They're abusing them um, because they've got unrelieved pain. And what about that, the issue of marijuana as pain relief? Coralie? So the Lambert Initiative at Sydney University is doing a big piece of research on medical marijuana and I think we have to wait and see what the research says. Yep. I okay. mean, certainly it's being managed as um, an agent for pain management in other countries quite successfully. Right up the back, sir. Yes, thank you. Um, this is for Jennifer. Do you think it's dangerous to take away people's pain completely? Uh, yes, so... Uh, for these um, people that do have the NAV 1.7 gene, um, they don't have NAV 1.7, um, they do suffer a lot of injuries. Um, so in childhood, like, things you wouldn't even necessarily think of. So um, they might lose parts of their tongue because they bite their tongue. They don't have that, um, you know, they don't have that pain response to know you shouldn't do that. Um, they'll scratch their eyes um, as babies because they don't have that um, response. And they often do not live very long. Um, so they usually die quite young, these um, people that have this um, chronic uh, congenital insensitivity to pain. Um, so getting rid of pain completely would not be ideal. You would want to have some pain sensation um, left because pain protects us. That's what it's there for. Yes, sister. <laughs> <laughs> Our next question. Thank you, sir. Um, I was just wondering from a researcher's perspective, um, as researchers, how do you uh, reconcile what we know about the variability of, between people with pain thresholds and pain in general um, and selecting subjects for your research? Let's start with Richard there. Would you take that? Yeah, I, I guess the variability is an opportunity for us. I, I think we have the opportunity to start to understand the molecular basis for those differences. And when we understand that, then we have new targets that we can then look for new drugs at. And that's really what we're trying to do at the centre, find new targets. And so this variability is really an open door for us. Um, but it can confuse studies in, in terms of evaluating drugs uh, once we get into the clinic. But before that, we have, I think, an opportunity to, 
to investigate those differences. And it's this area of genomics that we're now in, really, for the first time, allows us to do that. Would you like to add anything, Irina or Jen? Not really. I thought Richard answered that really well. Okay, Jen. <laughs> yep. Okay. Thank you, sir. Could you just yeah. the same mechanism of injury? Why do they have a different response? And I'm, for example, a football player uh, would play football the next week, and the same mechanism of injury in a motor vehicle accident could lead to a whiplash injury, with the same forces involved, and that person may not go back to work for a year. Laura, I reckon you'll have a view on this. <laughs> Uh, I, I really appreciate the question because it really speaks to, to the heart of the complexity that keeps coming up. And, and I would even go so far as to say that footballer uh, might get mugged after they score a goal with their whole team on top of them and be pain free for, forever. Uh, but if exactly the same thing happened walking down a, a street in a lonely part of Rio, uh, they might never play again and they'll be crippled by chronic back pain and neck pain forever and it's the same individual. So, I mean, one thing that our group's really interested in, and this speaks to the previous question about variability, uh, is the contextual factors that influence pain and we know the contextual factors, factors are critical in a clinical sense. Uh, I, I gave a really short answer to the, the third question from the physio students but the answer is now relevant to, to this question that uh, we, we know that the information that you receive early after, let's say, you hurt your back is a predictor and your interaction in that early two or three weeks is a predictor of your likelihood of recovery. Now, it's not, it's not a 100% predictor, but it's the most powerful predictor we've got. It's, it's above the type of injury. Type of injury doesn't really play a big part in determination of, of recovery in, in our space. Uh, the things that play a bigger part are contextual, cognitive, uh, with other bits of other sources of variability right down to a tissue level, and that's you know that's where some of the beautiful work coming out of here is potentially going to be powerful. But I would say equally powerful will be the people getting big data sets from the variability across populations, cultural factors, cognitive factors. They're they're all important. Can I just um, add to that, that we worked with the Cronulla Sharks two years ago during National Pain Week and I interviewed all members of that team and they were all living with chronic pain. Mm. So yes, they might look good because they've got a camera and they've got amazing physio teams and they've got incredible equipment that costs tens of thousands of dollars. They get back onto the paddock pretty quickly. But they're not feeling really good. Well, they've had facial surgeries yeah. multiplied by, you yeah. know, so they're, they're all in chronic pain. Thank you, ma'am. Um, Sue Croft in Brisbane, physio, our pelvic floor physio. So I've got some patients who possibly some of the half, ten of the people in this room might have been to see all of them. The patient individually has been to see perhaps ten people in this room because we're all working with pain maybe. Lorimer, I'm asking this of you first. How do we focus that patient on making a decision that you've got to maybe, um, you know, follow one direction for a while rather than confusing yourself with a whole lot of different input. And that question's reflected several times in the one that I've got too, the multiple carers. Oh, see, that's a really, that's a clangor because I, I, I don't have a spiel that we could give people. I guess I would fall back to principles of respect why you hear someone, the, the fellow teaching medical students hates the zero to 10 question, which I actually like from a research perspective, but I completely understand that from a patient perspective it's annoying. And my answer to that question would be, uh, why are you here? What, what can I give you? What can my skill set offer for you? And I'm, I'm pretty reluctant to say, and you ought to stop clinician hopping because I feel like that's that's a manifestation of something else and we're, we're clearly not meeting the needs like we yeah. could so I'm I'm really sorry to Sue, Sue to say I, I don't really know what to say in that situation but if if you ask me what would I say to the person in front of me and I could talk about someone I saw uh, yesterday uh, where I'm able to say this is my strength this is what I can do this is how I can help if you decide you want to come on board here great if if you haven't decided that yet, 
get back to me when you have decided that. If you if you do, so I'm I'm really sympathetic to Dr. Hopping, actually, because people are desperate and and they're clearly not having their needs. Well, what about the flip side of that? With the, this is a question from Christopher. With the potential for a range of health professionals providing care at a given time, doesn't that environment impede the ability to manage or minimise pain? And what can be done to improve the communication actually across multiple carers? You might want to speak to that, Hosan. So there's a bit of a, a philosophy of putting the person in the centre of the ring rather than having uh, the specialist or the clinician in the centre. And I think if you've got the person in the centre, then you're really seeing it from their point of view. Um, and, and look, a big team may or may not be good. Mm. It, it really depends on how they relate to the person in the centre. Just staying with you, Coralie, during your PhD you studied the influences on health professionals working with people in pain. What was the key finding? Mm. What system is the health, health professional sitting in? Because if the person is sitting in a compensation environment, there may be a lot of pressures on them to, to delegitimise the person in pain, and that was pretty ubiquitous. People inside a health system where... Um, there's a lot of research base for what's going on, probably do better and will have a better effect on the person in pain. It's really about empathy, kindness, research-based information, sharing, plain English, you know, all that. And I'll, I'll, Can I get back to Suze on, on that uh, as well? Because I've been thinking while uh, Carolee's spurred some thoughts. I, always, I also have a real sympathy for us as clinicians, because it's so hard. Mm -hmm. But maybe a nice response would be that if, if there are half the people in this room who have seen these patients, everyone in this room should be talking and, mm -hmm. and making sure we're on the same page and we're open and we're trusting and all that sort of stuff. I love this event because we can all get here and we can eat together, drink together, speak together, sleep with a clear conscience. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> we can... I, I, I'm a big believer in, in communicating with each other and maybe that's part of the solution as well. And so, yeah. From Alex to Lorimer, considering the placebo effect, can part of the message of pain be, please send healing my way? Can the way we think invoke chemical and biological responses that repair, heal and diminish pain intensity? Yeah, I reckon. Uh, on the placebo effect, I don't think it's an effect. I don't think it exists. I think it's the name we give to all the stuff we haven't actually worked out yet. Uh, because as we learn more about therapeutic interactions, what we used to say was entirely placebo, we now say is partly perceived expertise of the clinician, uh, knowledge of the clinician, a uh, whole lot of other stuff. There's even data to show that the better looking you think a clinician is, the more likely you are to get analgesia. I saw those eyebrows just rise, Irina. What would you like to say? <laughs> well, we want to hear what, you, what, what you're thinking. Um, <laughs> yeah, pass. <laughs> I'll pass on that one. Um, Laurie, I must be a very, very successful clinician. Oh, that's so beautiful. Thank you. Uh, you would be a great clinician too. <laughs> <laughs> Can we swap spots? Yeah, I think we should. <laughs> I'll throw you an easy one, Irina, from Michelle. Is it true latest research has found headaches might be linked to blood flow? Um, I think that answer would be yes, simply. Can we elaborate? Um, yeah. Yes, I probably can. Um, coming back to the message of, um, of tonight was making it personal. Is that probably... Um, when you say, uh, is headache linked to blood flow? I think the answer is that some types of headache almost certainly are, so um, certain types of migraine are, and it's been known for a very long time. Um, but uh, I think we need to get, get a little bit out of the school of thought that all types of pain are the same and all types of headaches are the same. So I think the message is that, sure, sure some types of headache really are um, related to cerebral blood flow, um, and probably others um, have different mechanisms, and we're just beginning to understand that. You want to add something, Richard? No, I think no you're happy with that? Okay. Um, from Emma, and she just says to the panel, why do I have more pain tolerance after having a caesarean? Is, uh, I'd love to ask Emma, how does she know that she does? Is Emma here? I'm not sure she might be live streaming that question. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, she might know that, you know, the 
I'm going to accept that answer. Thank you, Sue. But can I respond to Sue? Yeah. Th then I would think well, you'd have less pain as well. So it's hard to know whether you. you I can I can completely understand that Emma, wherever you are, would be would be tolerating more uh, physical danger, more yes. tissue danger. Yes. But I think that after a cesarean, the more likely thing to happen, I think, might be that uh, you have a different amount of pain in response to the same danger. Our next question, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I could be very well out of line here, but uh, and I'm not part of the medical profession. I could be described as the pain on the other side of your stethoscope. I have had a tremendous amount of pain, and recently I've been trying a product which is a redox signaling molecule. I've heard nothing about that so far. What about um, stem, cell, stem cell therapy, which I've been investigating as well, in regard to pain? Has anyone been doing any research on that? Okay, to the first part of that, the drug that... Redox? Irina, everyone's looking at you. <laughs> there you go. No. Um, at the IMB, that's... Um, not something specifically that we're working on at the moment. Um, we are um, working with some of the other centres that we've got established here, the Centre for Inflammation Research, and working on inflammatory um, pathways and, and ways to modulate pain through modulating inflammation, so that probably relates most closely to um, the redox system, perhaps. Um, and stem, stem cell therapy, I think, is um, definitely something that's very exciting. Um, how it will relate to pain, I'm not entirely sure because um, I'm not, not necessarily convinced that there's something inherently wrong with your pain sensing neurons or danger sensing neurons or whatever that, that you would need to, um, to fix necessarily. I don't know if Laura feels differently about that in terms of stem, stem cell therapy. Um, it's not something that I'm personally f uh, familiar with at, this, at the moment, but it certainly has great promise overall. Thank you. Um, Richard, you're developing a pain app. How might, how, might, how might that work? Well, I guess, and it came from the last, um, the last pain um, open, open house. We, we thought we weren't reaching out enough. And the idea was if we had a pain app, and it was three early career researchers, really, that put this together, um, that basically the idea was could we reach out to the public and give them tools to better understand and manage their pain. So the idea was to be able to better track their pain and be able to present this then to their GP. And the idea then would be to get perhaps better monitoring of, of treatments. Now this is one pain app. I know Coralie is actually with Chronic Pain Australia doing another pain app. Um, again trying to outreach to people to allow them to better manage and better cope with their pain. Uh, from Erin, is there a question here? No, sorry. From Erin to uh, Arena, how can we better manage pain in children? In children, that is um, that's also a very important question. I think um, I think it probably partly relates a little bit to to Lorimer also about how we um, you know, what pain is and how we evaluate that in in people um, from. A, from a molecular mechanism perspective, I think we're also just beginning to understand that um, pain mechanisms in children can probably be um, a little bit different, especially in young infants, um, can be different to um, what, hap what happens in adults. Um, but it's probably an area that, area that we're doing even, even worse in than with adults. Don't know. Yeah, it's something we should all do, though, isn't it? The really tricky thing for kids is that often people don't realise that there is quite a significant number of kids that live with... Can you just turn on the microphone? And, and I think that's, that's really hard for, for kids. So when you do meet a kid who may, may have um, juvenile arthritis um, and who, who meets other kids that have got pain, it's quite enlightening for those kids. They tend to feel very alone and very isolated. And I think, you know, historically we've been told, you know, oh, the kids just got growing pains, that there may be an underlying disease state. Um, well, you talk about growing pains. One question here is, what causes phantom pain? <laughs> Go, Lorimer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we don't, we don't know from a biological mechanism perspective 
uh, from a from a neurophilosophy perspective, I would say the same thing as I said to you before, Sue, that, that the brain is trying to protect a part of the body that doesn't even exist, and that's really intriguing, and it challenges some of our, our models of pain. You know, it's, it it's really is at the cutting edge of trying to understand. Um, there, a lot of people might be familiar with ideas of, of changes in the way the brain is organised, in particularly in primary sensory cortex, uh, but there's a bit of there's a bit of contention over that at the moment. Different groups are, are bringing out results that seem to be contradicting each other. Uh, so it's a bit hard to know, but uh, I guess if, if you took a, if, if I change the question slightly to be why, do you, how can you still get phantom pain mm -hmm. when you don't have the limb? Then I would say, well, all pain is actually illusory. It's it's an illusion, and it's it's produced and projected towards a body part. There was a question about before where do you where do you feel pain and I would say you always feel pain in the location that it hurts and you feel it in your knee uh, but you don't need the body part to produce that feeling so the feeling is is produced on the basis of maps within your brain of your body and is projected to a location um, this idea of space you know we can project it to space you can even project it onto someone else's body uh, and we do that using experiments that are uh, are really quite intriguing uh, but it proves to us that you don't need the body part to have pain in it, but you do need the brain's representation of the body part. Would anyone else like to add something to that one? I know you're thinking about it, Irene, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, OK. Look, that brings down the curtain on our panel discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, could you please give a big round of applause for our panel? And I'd like to invite you to stay and chat with our researchers at our discovery tables. Enjoy refreshments in the auditorium foyer. Come up and ask Lorimer your own question. As you've heard, the IMB Centre for Pain Research is developing a mobile health app to help chronic pain patients track their pain and help patients, clinicians and researchers achieve more effective and personalised pain management. But they need the help of chronic pain sufferers to complete an anonymous survey and have their say on what would make this app truly effective. The team will also be in the foyer and happy to chat with you uh, about the app and the survey if you would like. Thank you.